What's going on, everybody? You're back with the Real Bodybuilding Podcast, and I'm here with the newest Olympia winning coach, Mr. Matt Jansen. How are you, sir? What's up? How are you? Uh, good, man. We This is a long time coming. I've, I've wanted to have you on the show because, you know, I like to get the top coaches on, and you've now become, I think you've kind of ha- like vaulted yourself into that upper echelon of coaches with this latest win. Not that you weren't there before, but this definitely like puts you there so yeah thank you i mean it's it's been so surreal like honestly i mean um i have just had this goal for so long that i wanted to achieve and and how it happened and who it happened with and just the whole week that we had together i mean we could talk a long time just yeah. about that but um the whole thing has just been like i felt like this huge burden like self-induced burden kind of just released from me um now obviously we're now on the other end of the spectrum where you know, we need to hold the title now and that's the goal, but, um, it's, it's really been incredible. Like I, I can't thank everybody enough for the support that they've given me through this. Um, you know, this was a dream. This was a dream come true for both of us. So it was, it's been awesome. When you say there's a burden you wanted to release, I don't, I don't know how many coaches expect to win the Olympia, but was, that was something that was like on your shoulders. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been the reason, I mean, ultimately one of the reasons why I've done this from the beginning is I wanted to, I wanted to win that. And you know, the, the, basically the, the biggest title you could win in bodybuilding, like that, that's, that's what I've wanted to do. Yeah. So you've had that ambition from the beginning. Cause I mean, it's crazy. A lot of people that start coaching that have a passion for it, want to make their clients great and they want to have a big roster and they want to help people win. But they're the first person I've actually heard say I wanted to win an Olympia. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely did, you know, and, and I think too, like, I know we just discussed this. Um, I feel like each coach is given their moment in time. And and then from that point on, like, it's, it's up to that coach to what they do at the moment. And I felt like a, a lot of my moment might have been with Dallas. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then for a long time, like, I felt this void, like, I felt like, obviously, first and foremost, Dallas was so much more than just a competitor to me, but but the potential that he possessed. I, I never really knew if I was going to get that again, you know, and, yeah. and now like, I, I honestly feel blessed. I have that on several accounts. You know, I know that you, you know, you and Nick have, have gotten a good relationship. Yeah. Um, Nick has come into my life like a lot, like a Dallas figure, like um, Nick and I do bodybuilding because it's what we love, but like in, in the background, like what thing, people don't see is just a relationship that we have, like how caring, uh, you know, that's something else I want to say. Like Nick's heart, Nick has a heart of gold. I know. Um, and, and I want people to really be able to see that side of him. I mean, there's very few people that, that ask how Matt's doing. And, and Nick is always one of those people. He's always checking on me, always checking on my family. Um, so I kind of got on a, t- you know, sub subcategory there, but yeah. yeah so I, I felt this, like, I've, I've always been very hard on myself, you know, even, um, and I'll, I'll just be really transparent. Like this last summer, um, I was actually in the car with my wife. Uh, we had just, gotten back from my appointment at the doctor where I was told that my, my pec was completely torn off. Mm-hmm. Um, we hadn't gone back into our home yet. And I was, I was crying in our driveway, you know, and I was just basically telling my wife, like, I've always had this desire to be a champion. And I feel like I've always just fallen short, you know, I mean, even yeah. like in, co- in college, my goal was to always be a collegiate athlete. I accomplished that goal. And then I got injured in college and that was taken from me. Um, you know, and then I've had this goal so long to turn pro in bodybuilding. And I felt like I was like right there knocking on the door and then I tear my pec. Um, you know, but I've, again, like another thing that's happened over the past few weeks is I just have this sense of relief. Like what I've accomplished with Sean, I know I personally can't accomplish the level that we just accomplished as a team. Yeah. So it's kind of taken away this, like, feeling inside me that I have to go pro because even me going pro, I ultimately, in, in my har- hierarchy of what I view, I still view Sean's title better than that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, 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 it's been awesome on several different accounts. Wow. You, uh, you touched on a whole bunch of different things. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go back and share everybody with everybody who we're talking about. Cause there's actually a lot of people that watch this show that aren't hardcore bodybuilding fans. So the first thing I want to do is share your page. This is Matt Jansen's Instagram. Follow Matt Jansen eight. Um, this is a lot of your coaching stuff is on here. Now this is Sean Clarita who we're talking about. For those of you who don't know, he just won the two twelve Olympia this past this past Olympia that just went by. And the interesting thing about Sean is he started at like when did you? How long have you been working with Sean? 
We started in uh, May of 2016. May of 2000. So you've been with him for four years now. Sean is a very small person. I, yeah. I don't know if it. I don't know if it shows in this, in these photos. But he's what, like five three, five four, five five one, five five one. And I think I'm gonna guess that when he started with you, he's probably like what 170. He competed the first year. I think he was at. Um, I want to say 159. Yeah, this is okay. And how much does he weigh here? Uh, one ninety, I would guess. He was uh, no, he was uh, one seventy seven there. Oh, he's only like seventeen pounds more. Yeah, 18, 18 pounds. Okay, yeah. this it does regardless of the weight. This is spectacular. Like I said, he looks like he's one ninety, and this is a dramatic change from what he was four years ago. Yeah, like you've done. I mean, obviously it's his training and his hard work, but with obviously with your guidance, so. I mean, it's incredible what you've done with him. So I just want to show people kind of where, where, who we were talking about. Um, and then going back to Nick, Nick is a very caring person. I, I barely know Nick. We just started doing the podcast together and he was messaging me for no reason after I pulled out of Chicago. Yeah. Saying, Hey man, I hope you're okay. Hope every, you know, like it, it's just a very, he's a different kind of person. So I understand yeah, what you mean there. Um, the muscle doesn't match the heart. You know, he has this impossible appearance that, he isn't who he is, you know, I think yeah. just because of how big he is. Yeah. But if you really get into Nick's inner circle and, and get to know the person that he is, um, he's got an incredible heart. Yeah. He said to me one day, he messaged me one day and he goes, do people think I'm an asshole? And I, I go, I don't think you're an asshole. I go, I think, I go, I don't think people think you're an asshole. I go, I, you're just a big guy and you're intimidating. Right. And I, I go, I think being on the podcast, cause he, it was related to the podcast. I go, I think you being on the podcast has shown people that you're a nice guy and you're normal and you're funny. And he's very funny. Yeah. Very yeah. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways. Um, okay. So going back to you, you, I didn't know you had aspirations to turn pro. I know you trained hard and you love training, but I didn't know that was one of your goals. Yeah. I think honestly, you know, as a young coach, um, I think, you know, for any coaches out there that are young, like, I think one of the best things that we can do is continue to be our own body of work. Um, and because, you know, and, I, and I've had pro wins and I've had a lot of guys turn pro and that's all extremely meaningful things to me, but like, I haven't had that monumental event. So up until that monumental event, like I felt like it was my responsibility in the industry to keep driving my own progress up. Yeah. Um, you know, just because ultimately, like, I, I don't feel as accomplished as Chris Aceto. I don't feel as accomplished as Neil Hill. And then ultimately until I get there. I feel like I keep needing to improving my own body of work, you know, yeah. through my clients and also through myself because I'm young. So like if I'm young and I'm not walking the walk, I, I wouldn't be attracted to myself. Yeah. How old you know? are you? How old are you? 31. 31. And do you, are you kind of saying that you experiment on yourself? Like with some of the things before you tell your guys to do them? Oh, for sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So when did the pec tear happen? That was uh, June fifteenth of this past year, two thousand um, twenty. And how is it doing now? Did you have surgery or no? I did. So it's actually it's been um, six months of constant problems. So I had surgery. Um, I had a complete rupture of the, of the muscle. It was all rolled up to here, and then about ninety percent of the tendon was torn. Wow. So they put it all back together, and through the initial surgery process, they should have put a drain in my pec, but they didn't. Yeah. So I had a ton of fluid buildup that actually nine days post-surgery busted out of my incision. Wow. So then I've had months and months of incision issues with getting the incision to heal properly. Um, you know, and, and a lot of this I'm, I'm honestly talking about for the first time, but I had this, this mindset that I was going to have like that Kobe Bryant mentality to an injury and try to get back as fast as possible and have it be an incredible story. Um, but I think I was neglecting my, my own body's like biofeedback. So I had this incision that we continue to have to restitch and do all this uh, wet to dry wrapping for months. So finally, yeah. my incision did close the end of October. Um, and then the week of nationals, I was actually in Orlando. I started to develop what, what to me looked like a hernia in oh. my incision. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I got an MRI, went through the whole process again. I had two abscesses one that was on the skin and one that was in by the uh where i was reattached yeah. so somehow through that process of my incision being opened i got infected in there um so i, I just had another surgery two weeks ago on my chest to clean all that out they had to re-put a drain in so now i'm just kind of in this holding period to see if that grows back 
Mm -hmm. um, and then if it does grow back, I'll have to have a port put in and be on an IV for six weeks. So it's, it's been a mess. It's been a total so mess. So can I ask you, is any of that related to you trying to get back too soon or is it just? Well, I, I think it potentially could be, you know, like I had to, to, to really kind of, I don't know if it's like lay down like the, my, my mental approach, the training or lay down my mental approach to trying to improve. But the only thing that I've done through this process, other than like the initial 10 days post-surgery, but I've, I've tried to always be proactive and rehabbing myself and, and doing cardio. And when this happened and I was told I was going to have to have surgery again, I just had like a real, you know, conversation with myself. And I was like, okay, the only thing I've not done is I've not truly rested. Yeah. Um, you know, so once I was told I was going to have surgery since November, I've just rested okay. um, in, in hopes of not being, you know, basically to my own demise of, of causing something worse. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any, are you doing anything? Like, are you training legs at all? Or are you just completely no, like no. just nothing? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's, after it's for me, it's very hard for me just to go through the motions. Um, yeah. and I might tell myself that I'm going to go through the motions, but 20 minutes into the workout, I'm no longer going through the motions <laughs> I know. You know, or I'm training with Nick. And then all of a sudden everything turns into a competition and it just, it's hard, you know, it's very hard for me to just kind of just be that way. So I've seen some of your training. You're, you're not Nick's size, obviously, but you're very strong. So is that kind of what you guys do? Is that part of your bond as you guys? Yeah. Kind of yeah. I mean, and, and I miss it. Like he's down here now, like he, he came down here for us to train together and I've not been able to train with him. Um, but again, I mean, he's taking it like, he seems like he cares a lot more about me than him training with me. And um, it's, it's been good. So, but yeah, I mean, we, that's the thing. I think if you talk to a lot of the younger guys, like, you know, even Ian and um, a lot of the guys that I've worked with that have reached out for coaching, I think it was because, we found that common ground of just really training hard. Um, yeah. And I could level with them, like the younger guys, the younger generation of guys, I've seen to connect very well with them. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I want to ask you about was the guys you train all tend to have the same. Well, I don't know all the guys you train. So I shouldn't say all the guys you train, all the most notable guys that I can think of that you train all seem to have the same type of uh the same type of physique and the same type of advancement in the sport they just they get this really rugged muscular look they get very big um you know ian's one of them nick is one of them obviously sean cleary even though he's a smaller stature person carries a ton of muscle um what is it that you're doing that's different than other coaches well i want to say too sean does do training with john meadows so i want to okay. say that as well okay um but I, I think the biggest thing that I do on a week to week basis within my approach is I, I specifically ask them to see their training. So I, like, I like to study their training as if I'm studying game film. And then I just try to pick up things where I can improve upon, okay. um, you know, cause to me, I think what's lacking the most within uh, coaching culture that's internet based is the ability to be hands-on in the gym. Yeah. Um, so if I can kind of bridge that gap as best as I can, because to me, I think the effort is where you really can just take off on people, you know, just really yeah. over time, just consistently putting an effort in the gym. And, and two, I think also, I want to say like, you can only do what you've been taught, you know, yeah. so hard work to somebody only looks like what perceived effort is within that situation. So if they've never been taught how to work harder, you can't expect that of them unless you show it to them first. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's the thing. Like I, I really, really harp hard on the, on giving effort execution, taking pride in that, you know, like viewing training as if like Tom Brady, I mean, Tom Brady still goes out and throws routes. Why is that? Because he can still get better. He's 40 something years old, yeah. but he still knows he can get better. And I think if we view training that same way, it just, it streamlines the progress. So when your athletes send you their coaching or, or their training, are they just writing everything down in a journal and then kind of sending you a snapshot of it or what no, are they doing? I, I send the training and yeah. then they're sending me actual like sets footage of yep. what they're doing. Oh, yep. so it's, okay. So I've had people do that. They tag me in their, in their sets of whatever they're doing. And then what you'll just critique. You're not training hard enough. You're not going deep enough, yeah, or I just, whatever. I send them a voice memo back typically over the training of what they're doing and, and where they can improve or if they're doing great. And I tell them that and then, you know, go from there. Is that something you do with all your clients or is that yeah. more upper echelon guys? Yeah. Everybody everybody how many clients do you have i have about 120 so this is a full-time job this is your full only time. this is your thing this is the only thing you do well i i mean i own two supplement companies that's too, true so i'm yeah. i'm working a lot yeah. yeah i don't know how you do it 120 so, clients plus you just started raw raw supplements right right and then revive yeah and revive and you're also part of revive so you're running like yes is your wife part of that or how is anybody else oh, helping so, you? so Domin dominic and i own raw and revive together 
Okay. Um, and then as far as my coaching goes, I actually, I, I made a decision the second month. So, so when COVID hit basically in the U S for us, like the end of March, um, I had a big drop off in clients from overseas in March. And then I had another big drop off of clients in April. Yeah. So I actually hired somebody to basically revamp the whole backend structure of my website because I, I was not SEO and, and all that stuff, it wasn't really flowing as it should. So that's really, really helped my business a lot because basically yeah. the search engine that my website was on, if you search my name, it wasn't pulling up. It wasn't getting out to people. Sure. Um, so that's made a big difference for me, but um, time management for me is huge. You know, I, I work a lot, you know, like for, for example, yesterday I woke up at six o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. um, I had an appointment first thing in the morning and then I was doing updates pretty much from nine until six. Yeah. I spent from six to eight 30 with my boys. I tucked them in and then I worked from eight 30 to 1130 and then went to bed. So that's what a lot of my days look like right now. How many, you have two kids, two kids. Yeah. I have a, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I can't, most people, you know, it's funny. Most people say, I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time to do this. I have one supplement company, not two. And I don't coach, but I have the podcast and some other things going on, but I can't imagine the workload you have and how you like, how important is time management for you? It, I mean, it, it's honestly everything that's been, I, I'm very thankful for 2020 um, because I really just inventoried my whole entire life. I, I found out what I really needed to focus on. I found out things I was wasting my time on. Um, and, and basically there's a, a thing called a, a 618, which is all the hours in a week. Okay. And how you're, you, yeah, 618. What is 618? Sorry, what does 618 stand for? So that's, that's how many That's the amount of hours, hours during a week? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so basically, you're, you're breaking that down. And I might have just botched that. But um, <laughs> anyway, whatever the number is. Yeah. 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 We, did this, we did this breakdown of what my whole entire day structure looks like, where I'm wasting time, where extra time is that I don't realize is there. And then just trying to utilize that as best as I can. Yeah. You know, because ultimately for me, like, Dom gave me the opportunity with these companies um, because I, I want an exit strategy to coaching because it is so intensive for me. You know, like one day I want to be able to be a dad and I want to be able to pick my sons up from school and take them to practice and not have to be on my phone the whole time I'm yeah. there. You know, I, I really want to be present. So ultimately my goal is, is to, to continue to improve with these companies and then just be able to hand select people like, I want to run with Nick until he's done. You know, I have a couple, obviously Sean and I, we have some big goals and objectives. Um, we're at, but, but I don't need to financially make money from coaching. That's ultimately my goal one day. Yeah. Yeah. So I know this is a bodybuilding podcast, but you just touched on something I thought was really important, which is time management. When you did your 618, which I don't think it's 618, but <laughs> whatever, yeah, whatever the hour, whatever the hours in the week are, who cares? The point is when you were going through your stuff, what is something, cause I think this will help people. Cause a lot of people, always say, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. What, what are some of the things that you can point to if you can remember that you had to cut out of your life or that you were doing that was wasting time? Well, for one thing, I, I've, I've had like this, I think all of us bodybuilders can, can kind of see this, but I was overly preparing for my training sessions in terms of it was like a big to do, you know, like yeah. mixing my shakes and, and realizing like how much time, like I would, I would maybe train for 90 minutes, but it was like a three hour hoorah yeah. every yeah. day, yeah. you know, so really just trying to cut out that time. Another big thing that I did was I got cardio equipment at my house, um, which I understand that not everybody can do that. But for those of you guys that can, if you really look at a piece of equipment and what it costs and the amount of hours that it's going to save you over a year, I think a lot of you guys could probably potentially do that a lot easier. Yeah. Um, that, that was another thing that saved me a lot of time. Uh, I stopped, stopped doing this on Instagram. Okay. Um, so wait, let me, let me pick these apart one by one, just so I can understand them more. So when you talk about, I, I do understand what you mean about the whole three hour window of training and four, or for me, sometimes it's four hours. Sure. So what did you do? Did you, did you pre-mix your pre-workout shakes or like, how did you make it all faster? Well, so one thing that I did was I just stopped like glorifying the training window. Yeah. Um, and basically I just worked literally. Well, another thing that happened was I, I, I start, I moved my training into my garage. That's okay. a huge thing. Yeah. Um, but I basically just, I worked to the time that I was going to train. I, I made my shake in two seconds and then I went out and trained and then I came back in and it was immediately back into work and not like this, this post-workout, let's figure out what I'm going to post. And 
let's cool down and you know all the things that we often yeah. do yeah you know for those of you guys watching this i i challenge you to look at your time saver on your phone and see how many hours a day you're on instagram you, you yeah. your mind will be blown yeah it's crazy so okay so the first thing and i do do that like i'll have a pre-workout meal then i'll sit down i gotta let it digest and i'm not yeah. i'm not I'm not doing anything in that hour there. And then, right. I, yeah, I know what you, and then when you get home, same thing, I got to update all my, check out all the Instagram stuff, check out all the YouTube stuff. Okay. So I got that. So then um, you said the cardio equipment, were you going to the gym and coming home? Is that why? Yeah. That, yeah, that was typically my approach. Um, and that, and that again, I mean, drive time, traffic, you're looking at saving 45 minutes a day right there, you know, in yeah. most cases for me. Um, more importantly, I think this is a problem we all have is how did you stay off Instagram? What did you do? You just said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. I just stopped. I mean, I just told myself I had to stop. I mean, it, it, it hit me in the face. I mean, at one point it was like at four hours a day, you know? And yeah. I mean, that's, that's a huge number, but you, when it's 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there, eight times a day, you don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't it important, but this is how I justify that. I feel like it's important for my business to always be talking to fans or and like, you are correct. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there, there's definitely, I mean, like the, the Gary V system works. I mean, his whole philosophy was based off of just, he built his whole business basically off of communicating on Instagram. So I think there's merit to that. But yeah. I think, I think what I really tried to cut out was the mindless scrolling. Yeah. You know, yeah. So being in your messages is very important. Um, I mean, even like you and I, like if I wasn't checking my messages, this wouldn't have happened today, you know? Right. So I think yeah. being in your messages is very important. Commenting within your own po posts is very important, but just scrolling all day long and <laughs> viewing everybody's stories. That's, that's mindless. It can be. Yeah. No, I do agree. Okay. Is there anything else before we move from this topic? Cause I do want to get into bodybuilding stuff, but is there anything else that you notably cut out to make your day run smooth, more smoothly? Uh, and the other thing was I, I started really using uh, the calendar, like a Google calendar and just being very structured okay. um, in terms of my day-to-day -day approach and, and actually writing things down um, and instead of like waking up every day and being like, okay, what's today going to be like? I just, I've been very structured and timely just, just to save as much time as I can. Let me ask you this because, you know, you obviously have your own business. You work from home and I'm the same. And I'm sure a lot of people now are working from home because of COVID. When you get up in the morning are you still setting an alarm or do you start working whenever you get up so typically my wife wakes up a little bit earlier than me and that kind of starts a wake up process for me okay um and, and i try to be up no later than like seven yeah uh and then go from there so it, it really depends i mean often days i do set an alarm um something else i was actually just talking to some friends about this morning uh david goggins he talks a ton about like planning out your day yeah. And he says that if you plan out your day and you wake up in the morning to an alarm and you put that alarm on sleep, he said, you've already ruined your plan for the day. Cause you're basically yeah. telling yourself what the night before yeah. isn't important anymore. So that was something I heard. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's going to change things for me. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of little things like that, that can make you better. I, I find people just don't do them even though they know they're there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, e it's easy to say, I'm not going to hit the sleep button on my, on my alarm, but you get up and you're, <laughs> you get up and you're tired and you're like, ah, fuck it. You know what? Maybe five more minutes. Yeah, but, yeah. but I, but I do agree with you that those things do set the tempo for the day. Right. So. Oh, one more thing. Just before we go, we'll go on. Another thing yeah, I yeah. did is I, I went through my emails and I unsubscribed to everything. Yeah, I do that too. So like, so nothing in my email, unless it's, it's strictly business related is what's in my email now. And that saved me a ton of time. Yeah. And then I've color coded like, uh, revive projects, raw projects, camp dancing, like everything's color coded in there. So it's just extremely yeah. organized, you know? So when I started this, I actually felt like I was back in college because I had all these work assignments for myself, but like now that the process is there, it's, it's saved me so much time. It's almost like once you have the systems in place, then you, everything kind of starts humming along properly. Right. Right. Yeah. So let me ask you this last question about this topic. When you are, let's say you're working on client stuff and you give yourself from eight to 11, I think you said, at 11 o'clock, are you like, okay, it's 11 or do you let it hang over? Like, are you very strict with your times? No, with my client stuff, it's basically until I'm done. Okay. Um, and since so something else too, uh, on the topic of emails, I've converted all my client weekly updates to what's, uh, WhatsApp. Yeah. And I have the WhatsApp app for my computer. Okay. And I absolutely love it. It's, it's it really helped my it streamlined my communication with them. It's easy to view the videos. Whereas like before I was trying to do the video check-in processes with training, 
So yeah. you're getting people that are saying, hey, you know, my file's too big, this, that, and the other thing. So I had videos coming in everywhere, whether text messages, some on Instagram, some on WhatsApp. Well, now everything's streamlined to WhatsApp. Yeah. And the other thing is, too, is it's just one constant, I mean, you know, stream, stream of communication. So you're not losing diets and you're not losing previous updates and, you know, yeah. hey, let's check on X, Y, and Z X week, next week. It's like, it's all right there. So that, that also has helped me a ton. So you have the WhatsApp app for your computer. Correct. And that allows you to see like bigger video and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all uh, just, I mean, yeah, I can open it up to full desktop sure, size. Sure. Um, moving on to bodybuilding. I want to get back to the size game that your guys are playing. And I don't know if you're purposely playing it, but your guys always put on a ton of mass. You alluded to training before diet. And I think a lot of people point to diet first, but I've noticed a trend lately, especially with Patrick tour. And now you're saying it. You, do you think there's more emphasis needs to be put on training or diet? I know both are important, but are people, if I had to choose, I would choose that people put hundred percent effort into training and 85% effort into their diet. Okay. Explain why you're saying that. Because I, I truly think it makes all the difference in terms of progress over time, you know, because your our, our bodies want to find homeostasis. And if we keep driving the threshold, so they can't find homeostasis, it's going to have to, you know, take on new abilities to adapt to that mm -hmm. uh, versus you can think of so many bodybuilders, or I can name so many guys that are perfect at nailing their diet, but they don't train as hard as they should, but yet they never change. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously if we're talking like the, the sheer finer percentages of fat loss towards the end, obviously the diet has to be hundred percent. Sure. I'm just saying in, in general rule, I would rather take somebody that nails the training that, that trains like an animal that's obsessed about making progress um, and isn't always fine tuned with the diet. Do you think that's what a lot of people's problem is now? Because I feel like there's this culture of be careful, don't overtrain, be careful, don't go to failure. Like a lot of this has really come up lately. I mean, the, the don't overtrain thing is probably a couple of years old, but now there's this whole new philosophy of, Oh, don't train to failure. Training to failure is bad. Right. And is that part of what's happening and why guys aren't making the gains they want to make? In my opinion, yes. You know, and I, and I do want to say like, if, if we want to talk about like, like the whole reps and reserve thing, yeah. um, which Dr. Mike has, I think, taken and really brought to the forefront. Can you explain what reps and reserve are for people that okay, are listening? Yeah. So, so reps and reserve is if, if you're looking at a set, like a three reps and reserve, meaning that you stop the set with three reps left that you have to still give or mm -hmm. two reps in reserve or zero reps in reserve. It's just, a, it's basically a, a system to put a stopping point on how close to failure you're going to achieve. Isn't it the um, same thing? Isn't it the same thing as saying it's like an RPE scale, it's the same thing as don't go to failure. Isn't it like right. you're, yeah. you're giving, yeah. people, so, giving them a number? Sure. Yeah. Um, but within that being said, Dr. Mike, who has basically brought this to the forefront is extremely, he trains extremely hard, yeah. you know, and I had a podcast with him last week. And, you know, he's like the, the problem with the system or what happens is I tell people to you know, do a three reps in reserve, but in reality, they're on a hack squat, they're doing an eight reps in reserve and they think it's a three. That's right. You know, and I think overall that general concept is what the issue is, is that people don't really know what true failure looks like more often than not. Mm -hmm. So they're just saving. So they're, they're just re technically reserving so much. How do you explain to somebody without actually being there what failure is? Because I find to be that's the hardest part for me also. Okay, so this is this is what I like to do. And this is a little outside the box, but I like to try to bring failure to that person in a way that makes sense to them or that's safe. Um, so what I tell somebody to do is to get on a spin bike, for example. Okay. Um, and I tell them this, basically like a modified wind gate. So they, they start spin, sprinting fast and then I tell them to crank the resistance up. And then I tell them to sprint as hard as they can until they can no longer move the pedals. Okay. And then that, that to me is failure. So okay. that feeling that then has gone over their body of complete exhaustion within that, that window of time is failure. And obviously there's an endurance component to what I'm talking about here as well. Yeah. But then if, if you can get them in that mindset of, okay, wow, that's what it feels like. And then get them safe within a movement pattern. Mm -hmm. Over time, just have them replicate that same effort that they just put in on the bike until they can no longer move the pedals, but now you're in a hack squat and tell them to do the same thing. But I think it's important that you do it in a safe manner first. Like uh, a spin bike is pretty much foolproof. Like nobody's going to hurt themselves, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so basically you're just trying to get them to know the feeling. 
before sure. anything. I think, it, I think it's really important that you experience the feeling in a way that's safe. I think most people would attribute that. I, I guess turning up the resistance would help, but I think most people would fail because their lungs would give out or something like that. That's the only problem I see with the spin bike. Right. They might, they might run out of yeah, gas. You've got to crank up the resistance or else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a good strategy. That's a good strategy. So how often, okay. So that, that's pretty intense. I mean, that's definitely pure failure. How often are your guys going to failure in a, like, is it one set per exercise, two sets per exercise? I, I really think the sweet spot, especially with advanced guys, you know, younger lifters, if you guys are listening to this, it's a little bit different, but I would say the sweet spot with truly advanced guys for a leg workout is like six to 10 total sets per workout. Okay. That's what I've heard. So, so if you're doing four exercises, you're looking at two, probably two, two sets, sets to yeah. failure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, is there anything, what about periodization of your training? Like, are you just like how let's take Nick, for example, and I know he trains heavy. Is he training heavy every week or is it like two weeks heavy, one week medium? Like, how does it work? No. So for, for Nick, um, again, I think it comes down to communication and then also the athlete really knowing their body. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out within, you know, basically a, a accumulating fatigue within his training cycle. So he's going to get to a point and he's very in tune with, Hey Matt, like I'm really starting to feel beat up. Okay. So when that comes, we try to catch it right before it gets bad. And at that point, what I typically do with him is I pull back on the training volume completely mm -hmm. um, about by 40 to 50%, or I just have him take an additional anywhere from two to four days off. Okay. So those are the two things I do. So typically when I say pull back on the training volume, I personally, for bodybuilders, I like to keep the load and the effort high. Um, okay. But if, if let's say if we're hitting a workout of 10 sets of failure, I pull that back to five to six sets of failure, but I keep the, the loading high. Sure, sure. And then if that doesn't really seem to help him recover more, then we're going to go into take four to five days, you know, three to four days off. We did that twice. We did that cycle twice last year. So basically twice last year, we reduced volume by 50%. Yeah. And then he also took, I think both times it was four days off. So he's not saying to you very often that he feels beat up. If he only did it a couple of times. No. These, these, have, these he also, heavy. He does two true rest days every week. Week in yeah. and week out. Yeah. And he does a lot of, re he's doing four uh, recovery sessions right now. Two are cupping sessions and then two are massage sessions a week. Okay. So he's so, very active in his recovery. Yes. And his eating is perfect. And, and he also sleeps like a machine. Yeah. He's okay. Of, like he has no sleep issues at all. Why is that? All during prep. I, I don't know. The guy's massive. Every massive guy. And has the other thing is too, and I mean, this is honest to God truth. His blood work is phenomenal. Yeah, no, he said that to me and I do believe him. He doesn't, he doesn't lie. It doesn't seem like he lies. Like, but um, it's really confusing that his sleep is good though. Cause normally a guy that big, they always have sleep apnea. Now he snores. Or... He, I mean, I'm <laughs> sure he has sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem to have, like, he's never one of those guys that you're talking to and he's just out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, driving in a car, he doesn't seem to nap. He doesn't need naps. Yeah. Uh, but he's very regimented by 1030 every night he's in bed. By really? seven o'clock in the morning, he's up. Yeah, like he's very, very regimented. So Nick seems like a little bit, I don't want to say meathead, but not, and I don't mean as far as smarts. I mean, as far as like the bodybuilding lifestyle and body, the bot, generally bodybuilders go to bed whenever they want. They wake up whenever they want. They're not very like meticulous like that, but Nick is very on point, like with yes. everything. Yes. Is that yeah. your, is that your influence or is that kind of how no, he came to you? That's him. He's just like that. I mean, obviously I encourage it, but that, that is him. Okay. When he comes to you and he says he's beat up, what does that look like? Like, what is, what is he saying to you? How does somebody who's watching this know when they, they need to take that rest? So there's a lot of different ways that this can manifest itself. It can manifest itself and just overly, you know, you feel joints that you typically don't feel. Um, sleep patterns can worsen. Uh, you could go from being hungry and on the same diet with, let's say, drugs the exact same or no drugs involved to all of a sudden you're no longer hungry. Yeah. Um, and if this corres it, you know, corresponds with with hard training, typically that's the culprit. So you got to pull back on the training, let your body truly rest, and then you could you can drive those levers up back up again. True. Um, you know, but for Nick, I, I, he starts to I think his immune system starts to get compromised. That's one of the first things that he notices, and then his joints. Okay. Okay um when it comes to diet i worked with you briefly i noticed there's a lot of variety in your diet is that is that something you do on purpose is there is the variety for micronutrients is it for taste what is what is the reason i just try to get people to enjoy what they're eating 
Um, you know, and I like using a lot of fruits, especially in the off season. I like using fruit juices and when the carbs get really high. Um, and then I just like to have, you know, people look forward to what they're eating because then cravings aren't as big of an issue. So um, if, if they actually enjoy it. So when you say, okay, so let's say somebody's eating four or 500 grams of carbs, you want them to get six or seven. You're going to use fruit juice for that. Yeah. I like, like, for example, naked juices, which are extremely dense fruit juices. I love using those with in guys in the off season, just because what? it, it goes down so easy. What's a naked juice. It's a, it's just a brand. I don't know if you guys okay. have them in Canada, but it's like a brand. Um, and they base on the back of the label. It tells you it's got like five apples, 20 bananas, uh, okay. seven kiwis. It's just like super dense. Okay. Okay. Is, but doesn't that fly in the face of the whole fructose is, you know, carb stored in the liver. Like, I don't, I don't, you don't believe, subscribe, I mean, I you don't don't subscribe do that. to that. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> what about the whole, if you add the fructose, if you add fructose to glucose, the glucose will um, absorb better or, or go to the muscle better. I'm sure that's probably bro science way to say it, but yeah, I mean, honestly, when I look at like, for example, I mean, I don't, I, I, there's a common denominator, so I'll just keep using it, but Nick eats a ton of fruit. Sure. Um, he keeps progressing. His skin's tight all throughout the off season. I just don't see it correlate. You know, like I, I think it's a source that people can, I mean, first of all, it's healthy. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of micronutrients there. Um, it aids in digestion. You're getting antioxidant benefits from it. Like, I just think that there's so many benefits for it to be, you know, quote unquote labeled something that shouldn't be within bodybuilding. So guys that are scared of fructose or guys that are scared to put fruit in their diet, you're, you don't even, you're just looking at numbers. You're like, this has this many carbs. I want to put it in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Cause I mean, we all, we all get to a point where there's only so much rice you can eat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, there's a threshold there. And then once you reach that threshold, you're done. It's like, you've hit a brick wall. But I think most coaches, like I've done this before where they'll start adding denser foods, like, um, like bagels or they'll start adding muffins. I do or, that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you but do that I, too. My, my typical approach is I go a ton of, uh, white rice until it, it starts. I start getting feedback that they can't handle more. Yeah. And then I typically go fruits yeah. and then I'll go those denser sources like the bagels, the English muffins, things like that, just to really push them over. If we need to push over and fat levels are still in a good spot. So is your, so is your approach. So your, is your approach just keep the, the food's got to keep escalating if the person's going to keep growing. Not necessarily, because I do think there's a point in diminishing returns, um, okay. you know, and, and I'm not one of these guys that makes my diet calls based off of your blood glucose, but I do think it's important to monitor, okay. um, you know, like if, it, for example, if a guy's blood glucose in the off season is, is trending into the 110s, 120s, like I'm not just going to keep slamming the food down. Okay. Um, but the, to me, I make my, my food choices and changes based off of their performance or lack thereof, and then what their body fat levels are doing. Okay. If their performance is starting to stall, but they're still lean, and even if they're eating a lot of food, as long as their blood sugar is going to go good, I'm going to keep driving the food up. Okay. Um, you know, but it's it's those three things. It's it's performance, it's body fat, and then and then blood sugar levels. What tends to go Maybe. first? Is it blood sugar that goes first, or is it body fat that goes first? I would say more often than not, it's the body fat, and then the blood sugar starts to to, to trickle off. Okay, so if somebody's body fat, let's say you've gotten to the point where you added, you have the rice, you have the clean sources, you have the fruit, and now you've added the denser source uh, or the junk food, whatever you want to call it. Is that, That's obviously the first thing you're going to pull back on. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So and then uh, typically, typically I'll then start to, re I'll keep the fruit in and I'll start to pull the rice back second. Oh, so you'll leave the fruit. You'll leave the fruit where yeah, it is. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. What, at what point is somebody too fat? Do you think? Like what's a body fat percentage or that you could point to that you'd be like, well, it, depends. So I, it depends on how they store it. If some people store it like really specific to one area, then I think you need to be more mindful of that. Like if it's in your lower back or if your glutes just really blow out. Um, for, for me, I kind of place body fat everywhere. Yeah. And I find that during the dieting process, those people aren't as hard, hard to diet down mm -hmm. as somebody that specifically holds it hard in one area. I've never heard that before. That's the first time. Uh, anybody's ever given me that answer. So I am typically somebody who's leaner uh, in the legs and arms, you know, but uh, lower back and ass is like where I store all my fat. So yeah, what does that mean? Is that, does that mean I have to work harder at staying leaner than somebody who holds it maybe more evenly? In my opinion, yes. 
So somebody who has pocket, we'll call them pockets of fat. They should stay. It's your recommendation that they stay leaner in the off season. Yes. Huh. That's interesting. It's it's, for some... it, because, because here's the issue that happens. Like for yeah. example, and I'm not saying this happens to you, but for you, Oh yeah. With your fine. legs, you might have to overly diet down your legs because they're naturally lean to begin with to get your lower back in versus somebody that the, the fat distribution is equal throughout their body. You're not having to overly sacrifice that body part. Yeah. It's just kind of all coming off equally. You know what? That makes a lot of sense because when I work with Hani, for example, Hani would say to me, we need to double the size of your legs because it's the first thing that's going to go away when you diet. So I yeah. worked, I worked in the off season to like double the size of my legs and it worked, but my, you're right. My leg size did come down from when I started to, to when I got on stage and I'm, I think you're right. I think because I'm trying to get rid of those big chunks of fat in certain space, certain places, everything else is suffering. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that means I got to be more lean in the off season, man. That sucks. <laughs> how yeah. much, how much leeway, how much leeway do you give your clients in the off season? Do you let them, do you let them kind of do it like an 80, 20 type diet or are they very, very monot like meticulous with their diets? Well, no, honestly, like I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of um, the mental aspect of trying to get bodybuilders to enjoy life a little bit more. Okay. Um, like I, I like to get people's bodies in a place where they can handle cheat days without negative repercussions. Okay. Um, and, and a cheat day for me doesn't mean going to every restaurant you can and just blowing it out. But a cheat day for me yeah. means like enjoying what you eat, certainly eating more food, just having a more relaxed day, yeah. um, not having to be so structured to eating every two hours, but kind of like letting your digestion of whatever you eat just dictate the day. I just think that there's so much benefit to that, you know, to an off season, especially an off season structure. If, if you can keep body fat levels in a place and drive performance up and allow people to actually enjoy those days um, and, and possibly give back to loved ones, give back to their significant other. I think it's important, you know, just for the overall structure of what you're trying to accomplish and the people that you're in your close knit group that you're trying to accomplish it with. Yeah. How often do you give somebody that kind of day, like that mental break? So ideally if, if I can structure it right and I can get their body tuned, which, which the, the prime example of this is somebody coming out of a show. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give them one meal a week first and then it'll go to two meals a week and then it'll go to maybe four meals within a day. Sure. Um, if I can keep that in and as long as they're not gaining negative fat, I like to do it every week, you know, just have them look forward to Saturday of being like, this is my day off. Yeah, um, yeah. Again, next day off, you know, his whole off season was Sunday. He could eat whatever he wanted to on Sunday. Seems like um, he doesn't now, granted, what? It seems like he doesn't take the opportunity to pick out though. He doesn't. He, yeah. he still is reserved. Um, yeah. Like, for example, this Sunday, he went out for breakfast and had a decent sized breakfast. And then he come, came over to my house for dinner. And yeah. we had like fillets and mac and cheese and um, potatoes. Nice. But he's still like, I was encouraging him to eat more than what he actually ate. Yeah, yeah. I like that. He's, he's like self, self driven. Um, how much of you, how much of you plays a part in these, in your clients motivation? Do you motivate? Or are you just a teacher? No, I definitely, I definitely try to like build confidence in them. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to say motivate because I think that's something that's here in the moment. Sure. Um, but I, I really do try to like grow relationally with my guys because I think it's so important, especially when you're trying to chase big goals. You know, I think like for a lot of people, you can not haphazardly win your pro card, but, um, but to accomplish like an Olympia title or accomplish even, even a pro win, um, I think you really have to be in tune with your guys, you know, to have that happen, yeah. especially repeatedly. That's a good point. Actually. I never, I never considered that. So your part of your coaching strategy is actually to become friends with your clients. Yeah. I mean, I try to, and that's honestly, that's also the hardest part. Like um, one of the hardest parts of my job is losing guys. Like I, I absolutely hate it uh, yeah. because it just, it's, it's like you're losing a friend, whether that could have been over a potential bad result. Um, Especially like for me, um, to lose somebody that I know that we both put equal efforts in and the result wasn't what we wanted and there was, there was frustrations after that, it's, just, it's hard. Yeah. It's definitely a hard part of the process. Are you the kind of coach that takes responsibility first over the client? Yeah, I try to. Yeah. I'm not, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not perfect, but I, I do try yeah. to own up to, to what I do for sure. Yeah. I've always felt that way. If I had a client that didn't get the result they wanted, I always – 
even if it wasn't my fault, I always felt like it was my fault. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we went through some of the carb sources you use. I'm curious about your system. Are you a low protein guy, high protein guy? Do you like using fats in your diet? I would, I would honestly say that I'm, a. it depends on, on who's judging me, but I would say I'm moderate to high protein. Okay. Um, and then I do, I do like to, um, bring fats into the diet. I'm going to, I'm always going to be somebody that tries to increase carbs first. Yeah. And then I'm going to kind of try to stabilize, um, basically satiety through the day with fat sources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so for example, like for, if we're talking like a heavyweight bodybuilder, yeah, <laughs> out of a show, go ahead. I was going to say, before we get into fats, I, I'm curious what moderate, what's moderate protein and is there specific sources or does it matter? Is it more, is it all meat sources or do you like to use a lot of whey? Like what is, what is the protein of choice? Okay, I guess. So for protein, what I, what I like to do for protein, just to simplify it is I, I try to get their true contest weight and I multiply that by two. And that's usually where I set protein requirements at. So you're at two grams per pound. Yeah. Of that's lean a, tissue. I think that would be considered high protein. Cause yeah. like, cause like Nick, for example, is, you know, 250 pounds on stage. So you have a meeting yeah. five, 500 grams of protein. Well, no, actually specifically for Nick, yeah. he's only eating 200 grams a meal uh, of weight. Yeah. So we, we did that specifically for him because we're trying to continue to improve the illusion of his waist to sure. quad and all that. But typically for most guys, I would say I do about two pounds per pound of lean tissue, two this grams what, per pound of lean tissue. This is what I find interesting about that. So there's been a, a push in the last maybe two years, I think, or year especially, where guys are using less protein. Everyone says, oh, you don't need this much protein. You don't need 10 ounce portions. You don't need 12 ounce portions. When I work with Chad, we used to do 12 ounce portions. Like I was definitely, yeah. I was definitely doing two grams per pound, but that's when I was my strongest. And that's when I actually got the leanest for shows. Yeah. And when I present that to somebody who doesn't do the really high protein diets, they always say, no, it doesn't have to be that way. You can do it with the low protein and blah, blah. And I think they're right. You can, but you know, your guys are very thick and very strong and they come in very good shape. Is it the high protein? That's like one of the main reasons. I mean, here's the thing. I, we could talk like the, the bodybuilding research all day long. And, and I think there's like this, this culture now, of people that are just trying to disprove old methods. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not somebody that's negligent to the research, but I sometimes I just don't think it needs to be changed. You know, like yeah. I, the thermogenic effect from protein, that's proven. Yeah. Um, the muscle wasting effect of, of basically being able to reserve muscle in a deficit, that's proven. So like, why would you not want those two things present? Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to store body fat off of protein. Yeah. And as long, and here's, here's the variable that we need to discuss. As long as your kidney health is, is, is good, then high protein is not bad. Sure. So then why would you not want that? If anything else, it's just insurance for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, two things I'm big on, I guess you can say that I'm, I'm a high protein guy. Another thing that unless, unless it's been proven to me in a specific case with a specific athlete that doesn't work, I love to pull water hard. I still love to pull water hard. And there's a, there's a tremendous amount of people right now saying you don't need to pull water at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You no. Know? That's um, also that's also a new thing over the course of last year. So go before we get to that though, going back to the protein. So, you know, the other thing I've noticed is uh AJ Sims also does very high protein diets and his guys also come in very hard and yeah, have that grainy look to them as well. So I mean maybe there's something to it because you know, people are guys are the looks are changing. And maybe it is because of this new, you know, thing where people guys are doing less protein all year right. long. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think I've seen guys come nasty peeled on low protein. I've seen, you know, but, but overall, I just, I just prefer that. Yeah. Uh, and then you did, you asked me about sources. I basically like to use all sources other than egg whites. Um, and the reason why I say that, yeah. and I know that's kind of an outlier is because I've just seen so many issues with digestive issues with egg whites with guys. So I, I usually yeah. remove those first so breakfast for most of my guys usually starts out with whole eggs and either chicken or steak yep. um and then we go from there um and then the other thing i do like to use whey uh not everybody can handle whey so it kind of depends on the athlete sure. um and their digestive ability but when it comes down to like the nitty-gritty part of a prep they're going to be on whole food protein sources and that's it 
Yeah, that's what I I kind of preach the same thing. In the off season, I'll do usually post workout. I'll do a, a weigh and cereal or like weigh and something yeah. like that. Um, so is that where you would put your weigh? Is there other times of the day you would put protein shakes? Typically, typically around either pre workout or post. Um, yeah. most often or, or, or for those people, like, again, like I kind of just like to know people's habits for those people that like something sweet at night. Yeah. I might put it in at night just to kind of ease that, that crave at that point. Um, getting into fats really quick. Do you add fats or do you use fat from food sources? Like, are you doing whole eggs and steak and stuff like that to get the fats? Or are you adding like peanut butter, avocado? That's where I'll start. I typically, okay. typically start with whole eggs and steak. And then from there I'll go to like Mac nut oil um peanut butter nut butter things like that and just again but i so i would say that i typically try to get the most out of carbohydrates first sure and then once i feel like we're in a good place with their carbohydrate intake then i slowly add the fats in and then for those guys that really need the food then i'll start driving everything up from there both fats and carbs once the once the protein is fixed i find that fats with fiber tend to really like blunt somebody's appetite like for example like yeah. like avocado avocados have fiber when I add avocado, it seems to really halt someone's uh, appetite. Whereas if I use olive oil or some type of Mac oil or something like that, it doesn't it affect you quicker. Yeah. It doesn't seem to affect them as much. Is that kind of yeah. your, your philosophy? As yeah. Well? I mean, I, I think the same thing can be said about the fiber content and like oats and nut butter together. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's a, um, that, that's yeah, a, bri totally a brick. That. Yeah. That's like a brick waiting in your stomach. Um, yeah. So are you doing a lot of sweet potatoes? Cause we're there's a lot of fiber and sweet potato oh. too. I don't use a lot of sweet potatoes. So on the topic of fiber then, because a lot of people say like, oh, you're not getting enough fiber in your diet when I do like my, my day in the life type uh, videos. I've always been under the impression that too much fiber is just going to slow down my appetite. And I don't want that as somebody who's trying to eat a lot. Right. Is that how you set up your client's diets? Yeah, I would, I would typically say that all my client's diets are low in fiber. Okay. Is that healthy? Well, Ultimately, I think it needs to be based off your digestion if you're having healthy bowel movements. But sure. I would say fiber around, and it depends. Like if you're looking at a guy on on seven, eight hundred grams of carbs, you, I think one of the issues that a lot of bodybuilders face is if you're eating the typical oats and sweet potatoes and regular potatoes and rice, like, and you're titrating your carbs up to eight hundred, you're also titrating your fiber way up. So okay. typically as your carbs go up, you need to be reducing the fiber sources that you're using. Sure. Um, I would say for a lot of my athletes, I, I try to keep them around 30 to 45. Now, am yeah. I calculating that for everyone? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but I would say generally speaking, that's, that's where it usually falls. Yeah. I always just thought like the most thing that makes the com most common sense is, you know, you want to get the calories in and out and the longer something's yeah. going to sit in your gut, the worse it's going to be for you. I mean, that's why most people switch sure. to cream or rice over oatmeal for that exact yeah. reason. So, I mean, I, re I remember way back, this was like 2011. I was using, um, my main carb source was sweet potato yeah. and it was the worst digestion issues I've ever had during a prep. Yeah. yeah, me too. I noticed, I didn't know this before, but I switched back to sweet potato like a year ago and I was eating it. And I was having really bad stomach problems. And I'm like, I, so I started doing some reading about it. It wasn't just the fiber. It was the sugar alcohols. Yeah, there's actually sugar alcohol in I don't remember which one it is, but there's a sugar alcohol in sweet potatoes that can actually cause gas and bloating and all these other things. So, right. Anybody who's eaten like one of those diabetic candies can attribute to what sugar alcohols does to you. So I, I dumped the sweet potato right away, went back to potatoes and rice and, you know, the faster digesting foods. Um, yeah, I mean, for my guys, it seems to just do better, honestly. Yeah. So going back to the water uh, thing, that's actually interesting too, is one of the most, you know, one of the more modern um, approaches to getting on stage is guys will leave their water in. I mean, Ian, Ian just said it this past Olympia. He said he left his water in. He said he barely changed it at all going on stage. Now I will say Ian is one of those guys that needs water. Yeah. I was just going to say Ian's like kind of an outlier. He's not the, yeah. the normal case. But yes. with, you, with, with your guys, when you say you like to pull water hard, what does that mean? Are you starting on like Wednesday, Thursday or? Two days out is when I, I, I basically keep it constant until two days out. And then I start to manipulate it. Like off the top of my head, I think Sean had uh, like 46 ounces of water the day before the show. Okay. 46. So less than, that's less than a half a gallon. 46 ounces, less than half a gallon. So less than two liters. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's not bad. 
it's not horrible yeah because i've done i've done day before the show i've done like 250 milliliters and that's it like wow. chad chad used to pull really hard honey pulled really hard too yeah um so you're and not I going mean, look, look at their body of work like i mean it, it it still works you know like that's one yeah. of those things like i just don't think that everything i think that we need to be aware but like i don't think everything needs to be changed and obviously like you said ian is a great example um I think Ian, one of one of the best looks that we had as a team was at Vancouver in yeah. 2018, 19, whatever year that was. I'm getting my years yeah. confused, but um, he had nine liters of water the day before the show. You know, like we didn't pull it, we didn't even touch it. Um, yeah. But he is an outlier. You know, like what I've noticed with Sean in the in the five years that we've had together, every year I pull a little bit more water, and every year he looks a little bit better. Yeah. So even with so, so even when you have a even when you have a, a standard that you really believe in, you still experiment a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's negligent not to. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, switching to gear. Do you mind talking about gear a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I want to get into insulin and I'm not sure if you're a fan or not. Are you a fan or not of using insulin use? I'm not. I'm not a fan. Okay. I'm not a and fan. In, either. In any, I would say 97% of the cases I'm not a fan. Okay. So who can you explain why? before we move on? Yes, I do not like insulin because I think it creates a false sense of illusion with a lot of bodybuilders in the sense that they're holding onto tissue that they're really not holding. And then you typically, what happens is they pull it during a contest prep and then all of a sudden they're down eight to 12 pounds and they don't understand what happened. Yeah. Um, so I just, I think it just creates a false sense of fluffiness, roundness. And I would just really rather bank on the fact that it's true tissue um, something else that I don't really like about insulin is, is I don't know very many people who have been honest with me that have told me that they can train just as hard on insulin as they could off because they feel like that there's their, their heart rate is just more rapid while on insulin, even if they're fully covered. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've, I've just, even with myself, I've noticed a difference. Like, I just feel like this elevated heart rate, yep. even though I know I'm covered. Yeah. Is that, that's funny. I noticed the same thing. It's, I've never actually uh, pinpointed that, but I don't feel comfortable. I guess I could say like when I'm training, yeah. I feel like this, um, it's like a jittery, like, like you're going to go hypo, but you're not because you're covered like right. you said, with enough carbs Yeah, and you're, yeah. you're sweating more. And uh, yeah, I get that too. So you just don't, is there ever an instance in which you think it's valuable? If somebody take like the skinniest, person that you know that literally can eat whatever they want and doesn't put on any body fat i would say in that instance it might be valuable so for a real hard like gainer just, yeah somebody that that like literally you can throw tons of food at them just to kind of help the absorption process of the food now i'm not going to say i don't want to say that that insulin doesn't help shuttle nutrients during a training window i'm not arguing that at all i just sure. don't think that that benefit over time really carries weight um, for example, I, I absolutely would love and respect Milos. Yeah. Um, but, but I think there's this like thought process, you know, like when people talk about insulin, they're talking about mass monsters and, and all this size. But if you actually look at Milos, he had a, he had a beautiful physique, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say he was, he was a mass guy no. by any means. No, not at all. You know? Um, so somewhere along the lines, it's gotten misconstrued through, you know, bodybuilding forms or whatever that insulin is this thing that just blows you up when I, I just simply say to people like, show me the body of work where that, where it actually happened. Well, I think Without, it's, another thing too is the, the stomach issues. I think it's a miss. The stomach issues is definitely a big part of it, but I think the misguided part on the forums, for example, is guys gain a bunch of weight. You're like, Oh man, I put on 25 pounds. And that initial first week or two of being on insulin, like I got crazy pumps, like all these things, but the pumps wear off after your body becomes resistant to it. And most of that 25 pounds is fat and water. Right. So, and I think until, but people always want to use it until they, and then they experience that themselves. And then they're like, oh shit, this isn't, it's not real. But right. why, why does it have, other than that, it seems to have this, every time you hear about insulin, you hear, it's a super drug and it's going to help you gain all this muscle and all that. Is that just from the forums and all these myths of people putting on weight or has anybody actually done it? I personally can't name anybody. Yeah. Um, 
that I know of, you know, uh, and again, like I want this to be, I think, I think Milos has done so many things for our, for our industry. He's still, every time I see him at a show, I love speaking with him just because he's truly like so passionate about the sport. Um, I just think that his initial teachings have kind of just gotten just turned into this unicorn theory over time. Yeah. Um, whereas it's not even directly from him anymore. It's just like this, like, you know, playing a game of telephone. Um, you know, and, and seven people down the line, it's just a completely different story. Yeah. I but you're it, right. Every person that comes to me that, that expects something out of insulin is mm -hmm. somebody that hasn't yet used it. Yeah. 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 Well, it took me, uh, I used it at the advisement of a coach back in the day. And I realized after one off season, I'm like, this is shit. I'm like, it, it blew up my stomach more than I wanted. And I don't think the thing is this, I always wonder to myself, like, you know, when I talked to John Meadows about like intra workout nutrition, for example, because that's most of the time guys are using insulin. They're like right before they train, they want to take in a right. bunch more carbs. You know, John cites a study that, that says, uh, you know, you only need about 40 grams of carbs during training, 20 to 40, depending on your size. And I think to myself, can our body not assimilate? 40 grams like are we not using totally can't yeah so i'm like why do i need if that's the case then why do i need insulin i mean your nutrient uptake if you're a healthy individual your nutrient uptake is the highest around training yeah so that's the thing is i'm like if we can take it up anyways if our body's functioning properly why are it's almost like guys think if they take insulin they can take 80 grams in or 100 grams in it's going to make them even bigger right but most guys i know just get fatter and that's right. actually that's actually what happened to me so i'm not talking about anybody you know i'm going to use me myself as the as the example. So I don't know yeah. if it's valuable at all. What, what do you think is the most valuable? Do you think guys are using too much gear? Like, when, I think some people are for sure. Like when your clients come to you and you, you know, obviously you probably have a questionnaire they fill out. Are there, are the gear protocols out of control? Like are guys using more than they think they need? It, you know, it's interesting The the better quality of the guys that I get, um, and this is a God to honest truth, the less gear that they're running. Yeah. So when I get astronomical uh, gear reports in terms of a consult, when I'm looking at a consult, it's it's not from top quality, you know, it's top end people. Yeah. Um, and I'm not just talking about top end pros. I'm just talking about physiques in general. Sure. Um, sure. You know, I think that there, I am not somebody that believes you need to pro progressive overload your your gear like you do food and training. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we all have a sweet spot. I think that sweet spot is different, uh, but I don't think it's on the extreme high end. And I think once you find that sweet spot, you need to continue to milk those milligrams and then continue to progressively, up, you know, overload everything else in terms of diet and the training. It's interesting. You said that I, um, so it, early in my career, I ramped up every year. It would go a little more, a little more, a little more. And then there was a couple of years where I experimented with like a lot and I won't say the number, but it was, <laughs> it was not good. Um, but I realized it wasn't good. And I went back. And like you said, I found a sweet spot that's I, that's something I don't think is overly crazy. It's like around 1,200 um, to me is what, like when I was competing is what my sweet, sweet spot was. Yeah. So, but it's it's interesting that you say that because I don't, it, it, you're right. There's a spot where you can just be like, I can stay here. Yeah. And as long as I elevate my training and my food, I can continue to get better. Yep. So I, I don't think a lot of guys realize that. I think they think, okay, well, I did 800 last year. I got to do, do 950 or a thousand. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't, it doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't. And I actually think now that you've said that, I so it go, it goes back to something, you know, some of the other pros that have been on the podcast have said is milk each, each level for what it is. Like if you can, if you're still getting gains out of 500, stay at 500 for as long yeah. as you can. Yeah. So is that something you do with your clients? Like you keep them in a certain place? Yeah, I honestly, I, if you talk to my clients across the board, I think I very rarely increase the dosages. Yeah. Uh, very, very rarely. Because I just, I just don't believe like you're, you're putting a, a hormone in your body that's stabilized. Like it's going to do the job if you're driving, if you're driving the performance up, it's going to do the job. Sure. You know, I mean, I, I just truly believe that. When you run a cycle, are you running... I've seen some pretty complex cycles and it, admittedly mine are never complex. They're like, you know, this, this drug, this drug and run them. And that's, you know, eight weeks, 16 weeks, whatever it may be. But I've seen some that are like, they start high and they go low and then they go back high. And there there's very, there's a huge variance in how they're run. Is that something you do or how I'm, do you, I'm very simple. 
Yeah. You're like, I mean, off season, off season for me, typically I like running test MPP and EQ all together. Really? Can you explain why the, why the MPP and the EQ together? Just because to, again, like through my own experience and then just seeing the results of other guys for a lot of people, I don't feel like NP, I'm sorry, EQ is enough. Okay. But when you combine a little bit of EQ with NPP, I just see really, really good results over and over again. Another, another drug that I like to use a lot in the off season and in prep is Primo. Um, sure. But the issue with Primo Bolin is just the legitimacy of it. And that's, yeah. that's something that I always struggle with is, is if, you know, I even write that to guys. I'm like, look, if you can't tell me beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is real, like, let's just forget it. Yeah. Um, you know, because that to me, that's one another thing within coaching that's that's so hard is is dealing with underground labs and um, whether the quality is is what we expect it to be or or what your what what's on the bottle is actually inside the bottle. Like that, that's that's a struggle, you know, and having mm -hmm. an eye to really determine those things and paying attention to when a cycle starts and what the actual response is and how much is fluid, you know, and, and things like that. But I, I've just really found that sweet spot, like 150 megs of EQ, 150 megs of NPP, and just put those together um, with a stable test base. That might be 750. It might be a thousand, whatever it is, you know, for yeah. some guys that might go up to maybe 1500, that's extreme rare cases, but yeah, I just think it works, you know? And, and again, like, if, if you view bodybuilding as an athlete and you set performance markers as an athlete should, the, the drugs are there to support that, that the drugs are not the driver of that. And that's yeah. where I think people's mindsets need to change. Yeah, I agree with that. So when you set that stack, you're like, okay, this is it. These are your three drugs. You're not playing this game with no, the, not, the amounts. No. no. Okay. How do you feel about Anavar in the off season? Cause I was recently, recently talking to Phil Viz and Phil said that he feels that Anavar can be just as good as Anadrol. But I, I honestly love Anavar because you can yeah. eat on it. Yeah. Um, and that's something else I want to say too. Like when you guys, whenever you're doing anything with anabolics, don't let that choice override your ability to eat. Nothing is going to be better than your ability to eat. Yeah. Um, I, I love Anavar uh, off season in prep. But like, for example, if, if I were to use Anavar, typically I would pull the EQ out. Okay. Um, I really, especially for off season, I just like using three things. Yeah. Three things max. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. And also too, because then you can actually learn of what each individual thing is doing. If you have five things in the mix, you don't know what's doing what. Yeah. Do you have any athletes that have issues with NPP being an anxiety drug or not an anxiety drug, but causing anxiety? Yes, I do. Okay. Cause that's one of my things with DECA. Every time I use DECA, I can feel my anxiety spike. Yeah. Like immediately, whether it's NPP or, or durable. And, and then I matter. also have a few guys that are extremely proact prolactin sensitive. Okay. Um, so I just can't use it with them. Okay. I mean, it's like they get gyno flare up like that and then it goes away, but like the longer they're on it, the worse it gets. What's your, obviously with that stack, you're probably throwing in an antiestrogen. So what would your antiestrogen of choice be? Typically it's aromasin in the off season, just for health reasons. So like 20 milligrams every other day kind of thing or every day. Well, like, for 750 megs of test, what I, what I like to do is I like to use Novadex so you can get away with even less aromasin. Okay. Um, so for 750 megs of test, I would say 12.5 every two to three days. Of Novadex? Of aromasin. Of aromasin, okay. And then, okay. and then Novadex would be daily. So you're using both all off season? Yes. And that doesn't mess with your IGF or GH or anything like that? I don't think so because you're putting exogenous hormones in your body. Okay. Can you answer me one more? I don't want to make this whole, t whole conversation about drugs, but I just have oh, one more, good. one more question. What, um, I've heard that after a certain level of GH, you're just not going to get anything out of it, whether it be eight, six, I use or eight, I use whatever, but I've also heard guys using, and this may be a myth because they didn't tell me from their mouth, but I've heard guys using 14, I use 16, I use, what do you, how do you feel about that? Well, so the first thing I want to say is that the more you use, the more risk you're putting yourself at um, increasing your blood glucose levels. Okay. Uh, so that that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I will say, though, that titrating up GH is some of the best results that I've seen with guys. Okay. What do you mean? What does titrating mean? Like so slow, just, slowly increasing? Sorry, in, yeah, just yeah. increasing over time. Um okay. I would say like a, a normal max for your, t I'm talking top level athletes with me is nine a day. Okay. Um, so you're seeing results with guys starting at like two IUs and then every week. Yeah. I would say, 
yeah, I would say starting at like two, I use twice a day. And then I, and, and I really a sweet spot for a lot of people, I would say is six. Yeah. Um, and then, but then again, like, to, like I, I do see a difference. I for sure see a difference. And even if it's just basically being able to maintain your fullness on less food during a dieting phase, I think there's benefit to that alone. What's the, mo- like the most I've seen benefit from is probably eight. And then anything more than eight, all I've noticed is water retention issues but is there benefit to doing more than eight and how are you doing and how are people doing it is it is it four in the morning four at night is it four in the morning four post-workout like what is this what is the formula I, with one of my guys i saw a really good benefit we we actually ran 12 okay um and we did two i use 30 minutes before every meal wow six that's, a day. that's a lot of work man i can't stand that kind of shit where i gotta like have yeah. a do a shot every hour and a half or whatever like yeah. I mean, it was a lot, but I, I did see a benefit to doing that hmm. um, in terms of fat. This was during a contest prep. So in terms of fat loss and then also fullness while we were pushing the diet. I've never done that. I've always felt like it would affect something if it was too close or too far from not too far, but too close to another meal. But I and guess that's if, the thing. It, it's a little stressful because like you, I mean, your, your schedule is it's literally yeah. all day long, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's very, it's going to be very scheduled, obviously, because you're not doing just a morning and a post workout. Let's say for somebody normal, what would you do? Somebody doesn't, somebody doesn't want to do every two hours. Sure. Okay. So for somebody just to get the most out of it, I would do first thing in the morning upon waking. Yeah. And then I would do post workout. Okay. So if you're doing eight IUs or six IUs, just do three and three. Three and three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or okay. Two and two, whatever you're doing. Um, even, before even for like, for example, for a girl, if yeah. they're going to do one and a half IUs a day or one IU a day, I still recommend that they split it. Yeah. To get two doses. Get the out most of out, of, out of the growth out of around the training window as well. Do you got anybody using IGF? Not right now. No, it's too hard to, it seems to be too it's, hard. It's, to too hard. It's, it's so unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll switch off of drugs. I want to ask you about your supplement company before you go. How rewarding has it been having your own brand instead of trying to promote other people's stuff that you don't necessarily, I mean, even when I believed in other supplement companies, I always thought there was something else I wanted to add to it. So how does it feel? How does it, how does it feel having your own company that you've been able to make the way you want? It's, it's been extremely rewarding um, because I truly believe in what we're, what we're making. Like, I mean, I take pretty much everything that we make every day. Yeah. Um, so it's been fun to be a part, part of the formulations. It's been, been fun to bring people into our brand that really believe in, in our brand. Um, and it's just, it's, it's kind of almost like something that I enjoy doing every day that doesn't really seem like work because it's, it's been something that's been a part of like my subculture for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet now I have the, the ability to say yes or no on things that I think really matter. Yeah. And have control of the testing and have control of the third party testing. And that just gives me a, a real sense of peace about it as well. Isn't that a really great feeling when you can say you can put together a formula and then test it yourself in the gym and be like, you know what, this needs more of this or needs more yeah. of that. And then you get it back and you test it again and you keep going back and forth until finally you have this formula where you're like, this feels amazing. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and you know, if it feels amazing for you, it's going to feel amazing for everybody else. You just have right. that. Yeah. And not only that, but like, I mean, another thing, Dom and I, we made this brand, like we wanted our parents to be able to take Revive. And my mom has had chronic migraines since I was nine years old. And she started taking our blood pressure formula, even though she doesn't have high blood pressure, but it helped her migraines. Um, And then like Dom's father only has one kidney, you know, so like the kidney formula was extremely important. So um, it's just like getting the the reports. And and one of the best things, one of the best parts about Dom and I's day from from Revive's perspective is seeing people's blood work. And yeah. seeing people's blood work that were like, Hey man, this is what my blood work looked like before we used your product. This is what it looks like now. And like, that's just so rewarding to see. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be incredible. Cause I know it's awesome hearing feedback that, you know, I had a great pump or I had a great this or I had a great that, but hearing somebody say my blood work got better has got to be even more than yeah. even more yeah. rewarding. It's, it's changing lives, you know, potentially. Yeah. yeah. So what is, Okay. I know you probably don't want to answer this or maybe don't have an answer for this, but if you had to pick which was your favorite to work on, is it Raw or Revive? I think Revive will kind of always be the, our baby just because it was first. Yeah. Um, and, and because we were told multiple times that 
it, that we wouldn't be successful because it was just too hard of a space to enter. Yeah. Um, and, we've, and we've made it work, you know? Yeah. So like, we obviously care a lot about both, but like revive was first um, revive was it, it's more kind of going against the grain, I guess you could say in a way, yeah. because it wasn't what everybody else was doing at the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say that that's revive would be the answer for that. All right. Last question. You probably don't want to answer. Or one of the last questions you probably don't want to answer. Who's your favorite client? <laughs> <laughs> who's okay who's oh, your man <laughs> um <laughs> my favorite clients can, you, can you answer that you can't answer that one. No, Wait, who's your answer. least favorite client can you answer that one, <laughs> can't answer that one either. <laughs> okay maybe we'll make it a little bit more diplomatic who is who is your hardest working client can you answer that john's answered that one i i had john on my podcast and i asked him if I was a hardworking client, he literally said, he's like, no, you're not a hardworking client. He's like, I have harder working clients. Okay. I'll say this. I don't even work with her anymore. Um, but Michaela Acock was probably the hardest working individual I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. What, what so, is, what is that? How does that measure up? Like, what, how do you quantify that? What is it? What is, what is it that that person, what is it that she did that made you feel that way? The, I'm saying this within her, her doing things with proper form, but the risk that she took and the, the lack of fear that she had to finish the set on the floor was second to none to anybody I've ever seen. Isn't that crazy? She that, had no problem crawling out of anything. Like I, I've asked that question to so many guys who train with really heavy weight or I ask, always ask them that question is how, and you train heavy. I'd be, I'd be, that's something you might have the answer to is, where, how do you not be scared? Like maybe, maybe I'm more scared because I've had so many injuries. Cause I was, right. I'm, I'm more scared now and I haven't even gotten back to training yet, but I know it's yeah. going to be in my head, you know? Yeah. Um, cause, when, Cause when I think back to before I had injuries, I didn't have any fear either. No. So yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, is there anything you want to, any message you want to kind of put out there? I always let everybody kind of give a last message before they go or anything you want to promote, anybody you want to thank? No, honestly, I, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, I also want to thank you. I think that you've been in an extremely bright spot in 2020. Um, thank you, man. In terms of our, of our industry, I think you're doing really, really great things. I also, I noticed it um, right off. I think it was at <sighs> Tampa was the first show when you did those interviews. Um, that's something that I've, I think it was Tampa. What, Tampa what interview? Was before New York, right? Uh, this, oh, what I did, uh, Ian and, and Hunter, stuff, right? Ian and Hunter. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, that's what I grew up watching, you know, like yeah. I'm still such a fan of the sport and for you to be doing those things. Like I, I really appreciate it. I know a lot of other people do. That's pretty cool. Um, man. Yeah. So I don't have like, I don't have any final say. I just, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, and, and thank you for what you've done over the past year. Yeah. It means a lot, man. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, yeah. it's always great to hear from fans, but it's cool. It's even more cool to hear from peers. So I appreciate it, man. Thank of you. Of course. Of course. Um, okay, everybody. You know what? Check out Matt Jansen's page. Matt, maybe you'll come back another time. We'll talk more Absolutely. shop. Absolutely. Happy to have on anytime. Okay, man. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.